Hello, hello, hello everybody and welcome to a set mechanics video. Today I'm going to be covering all of the mechanics, new and old, in Ikoria Layer of Behemoths so that you can understand them completely and simply without having to read this massive article and ask questions of other people. I've already done that work for you, but before I dive in, I do want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, remember to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know if you like preview season content, because my current plan is to cover all of the cards as they are revealed uh, officially, so uh, let me know if you would like to see that type of content. I will also be... Um, in the future videos talk uh, in, in this video i'm going to be talking about how the mechanics are going to be for limited and in future videos i'm going to be an analyzing the cards for limited so there's a lot to look forward to there okay without further ado let's dive on in the first mechanic is cycling this car this mechanic is great for limited it makes it so that you have uh overall more decisions in a game and smoother gameplay it's harder to flood out and it's harder to get mana screwed in when you have cycling cards in your deck so they are definitely high priority pickups especially for decks going to the late game the reason for this is Say you have a 7 mana 5-5 five five with cycling where you can pay 2 mana to cycle it. That card is not insane at any point in the game, but in the late game, it's going to be a 5-5, five five, which is what you want to be doing. You want to be spending all of your mana on every turn. So in the late game, a 7 mana 5-5, five five, a 5-5 five five is big on the board. You're going to want that type of card. In the early game, if you're missing your land drops, you don't really want a 7 mana 5-5. Five five. It's not a particularly good card for you. You can't play it in the early stages of the game, but what you do want to do is get rid of it so you can draw lands, draw your cheap spells, so you can cycle it away. It gets even better if you incorporate the fact that they usually don't make cards that are just seven mana five fives with cycling because that's not very exciting instead they'll make seven mana five five with cycling for a blue mana and the card will also have hexproof for example in hour of devastation they made a card just that was literally that card it was called striped riverwinder and it was a really good card because it was really cheap in the early game to get rid of and then in the late game you actually had a really relevant threat and that's generally how a lot of cycling cards work the example they give is a two drop that also has cycling so it's not the exact same boat but in the late game do you really want to be casting a two mana two two not really you'd rather draw into your more powerful spells you'd rather draw into your um like removal spells a lot of the time. So you can cycle away Stranith Stinger in the opposite scenario. So in the late game when it's kind of a dead card, you can cycle it away. So when you have cycling in your deck, you can afford to play these more expensive cards, which means you have more options, more decisions, and generally cycling is great for limited. Even if the card looks bad on the surface, keep in mind that having cycling is huge upside, and as a result, almost every card with cycling is going to be playable. Moving on to the second ability, uh, second uh, new ability. Uh, this is keyword counters. Essentially, it is a permanent buff to the creature, but instead of being a power and toughness boost, it is a ability boost, so it'll give a creature one of these abilities. Menace, First Strike, Flying, Trample, Hexproof, Lifelink, Death Touch. I'm not going to say flying twice. They tried to get me there, and then I guess I technically did, but that, I saw the trickery. And then Reach and Vigilance. Um, one thing I will note is when you are evaluating cards, leaving behind a permanent buff is a major thing. For example, in Magic Gathering, a lot of the time, a creature with flying is going to cost one extra mana. So, for example, we've come to expect Grizzly Bears as a 2 mana 2-2, two -two, and then there'll be some extra upside. But 2 mana 2-2 two -two for a ground creature is reasonable. But when it comes to flyers, we come to expect Wind Drake, which is 3 mana for a 2-2 two -two with flying. So if there's an ability that leaves behind flying, then you can kind of expect, oh, Maybe I should be paying an extra mana for that. Maybe it's like as if I'm making my creature better by like a one mana. So that's the type of thing you need to keep in mind. A lot of the other abilities are like not quite worth a mana. But for example, there are cards that give um, like lifelink. There is like spirit link, which will give your creature lifelink. It's not technically lifelink, but it works almost the same as lifelink. So there are things that will give your creature lifelink. And you can kind of imagine it as giving, making your creature worth more mana by, by leaving behind a permanent buff. So it's a combat trick, but it's also kind of an aura. But it's not really an aura because it doesn't really two for one you in the same way so if there are cards that can give like these boosts to your creatures keep them in mind they can be worth significant upgrades to your cards we're going to have to wait to see more specifics but in general i will say that the most valuable things you can give your creatures uh are oftentimes flying that's just generally going to be good hexproof for your big creatures lifelink is can be really good uh death touch can be good for your smaller creatures in particular so they can trade with the massive creatures that are running around in this format trample first strike and menace are also very good for your big creatures um if you can like combine keywords to c make combos first strike and death touch if you can get that onto a creature is going to be good if you can get flying and hexproof it's going to be good those are good combinations i will say that reach and vigilance are generally going to be less valuable than the others so if you view flying as oh i just made my creature worth an extra mana vigilance generally not going to be as good reach more situational it can be very good but a lot of the time it's going to be a little bit less good than those other abilities as well so keep that in mind vigilance and reach are a little bit lower than the others but they can still be quite relevant and good in the right situation and i definitely think you should view these counters cards as a lot better than you that you you'd think especially because like like 
generally three mana for plus three plus three might not be that good but if it gave trample on that turn it would lean towards being more playable and then if the trample sticks around you've got to think okay i want to now build my deck to synergize with this combat trick so i'll put maybe some more high powered creatures in the deck or things like that and the next mechanic is the really confusing one and i just want to say that if you mess up mutate don't feel like you're going to be alone a lot of people are going to be messing up mutate early on in the format here is how mutate works there will be a creature and it will have mutate and when you cast the creature you can either cast it as a normal creature so for example cloud piercer you can cast it as a five mana five four reach obviously red gets the classic reach creature so don't run your flyers into this or you can mutate it onto one of your non-human creatures. So you cannot mutate onto a human. Keep that in mind. I'm sure somebody's going to try and do that at the pre-release if they ever end up at a paper pre-release. But they're the the crux of it, you have to mutate onto a non-human. And then when you do, you choose to either put the creature on top or bottom. All that matters when determining whether you put the creature on top or bottom is the stat line you want, um, pretty much. Uh, the creature will have all of the abilities, Um it will technically have the name of the creature that's on top as well. So you might need that for some reason, but you want to basically just determine the stat line. So the creature that you put on top, if you can mutate under or above. So if with cloud piercer, five, four is big stats. So if I'm mutating this onto a two, two, I'm going to want to mutate it on top because if I put it on top, it's going to be turning my two, two into a five, four since it's mutating, it counts as the creature that was already on the battlefield. So that creature will essentially have haste or if that creature was tapped it'll stay tapped it's all gonna be like it's as if it's one creature now if your opponent interacts with that creature both of them die however if they interact with that creature before it has successfully mutated so while cloud piercer mutated is on the stack if they kill my card i'm mutating onto cloud piercer still enters so you don't need to play scared with your mutations you can be like you don't have to be afraid oh they're going to two for one me though if they just wait for the cloud piercer to resolve they will two for one you so if you are holding our instant speed removal spell that can kill the cloud piercer you want to wait until after it mutates on to kill the creature you don't want to be like oh i'll get fancy and kill the creature in response and cloud piercer will fizzle no you'll just have to deal with the four mana five four reach so that is how it works first you choose whether you want to go above or below Actually, technically, you decide whether you want to cast it as a normal creature or as a mutation. Secondly, you determine whether you want to go above or below. If it goes above, it is going to be the power and toughness that is used. It will have all of abilities from both cards. So, for example, Cloud Piercer will have Reach and its mutate ability and all of the abilities of the creature underneath it, whether or not it's the top card or the bottom card. You keep all of those abilities. The abilities are going to be the same no matter which order you put the card. What will change is the power and toughness, and it will still count, and the card name will still be the card that is on top. Okay, that is how mutate works. It's a very complicated mechanic. Also, interacting with mutate creatures, if you kill the mutated creature, it, all pieces go to the graveyard. If you try to interact with it in response, then only the card you killed in response will die, and then the mutated, the mutated creature will come in as just a normal creature. Okay, that's a lot of work to discuss, but basically you use that to com combine keyword abilities. You can use it to get haste, essentially. Noteworthy is there isn't a keyword uh, token thing for haste so that means there's not going to be a keyword counter they already said what they all are there's not going to be one for haste so you can't give a creature haste permanently that's not really super relevant because giving something haste permanently doesn't really affect it after the first turn so i can see why they did that but mutate will essentially give your creature haste so you can be attacking it with a 5-4 out kind of out of nowhere so you're going to have to be aware of what creatures can be mutated in the format and things like that uh, and this will like keep its vigilance or things like that uh, there are creatures that care about being mutated onto which is kind of cool uh, Things with Bristling Boar, it does clarify. When it says Bristling Boar, it means it's like saying me. So if you put your mutate creature on top of Bristling Boar, it will still have the can't be blocked by more than one creature clause, even though it's technically no longer called Bristling Boar. Bristling Boar will be replaced by whatever the new title of the card is. Final mechanic is Companion. This is a new mechanic, and it's actually a really sweet mechanic. It essentially forces you to build around um, the card. Um, I'm not going to be talking about specifically this card, um, because I'm going to be talking about the cards uh, in a different video. But essentially the way Companion works is it has a restriction. So for this one, your starting deck contains only cards with converted mana cost 3 or greater and land cards. So it's a deck building cost. If you meet that deck building cost, Karuga the Macrosage can, will start the game in your sideboard. And at any point in the game, you can cast him. This does not count towards your 40 card minimum in the deck. And noteworthy... After sideboarding, you can still use the Karuga, the Macrosage, if you sideboard into a deck that no longer meets the restriction. That's important. If you have your companion card in your sideboard for game one, in game two, you can sideboard into a different deck and still get the benefit from the companion. 
all you have to do is have your main deck configuration. So there's one uh, companion, for example, that makes it so all of your cards have to be, you have to have a singleton deck you, uh, other than land. So you can't have any t multiple copies of a spell. But if you say have two copies of a decent card that you want to sideboard into, you can then sideboard that card in and still get the benefit from the companion. The companion can be cast at any point in the game that you could normally cast it, and you can cast, uh, and you still can get the benefit from it um, in post-board games if you don't change it. And you cast it from your sideboard, and it does not count towards your 40 card minimum in your deck. So you still have that 40 cards in your main deck, then you get the companion that you can cast every game, and your opponent knows that you have the companion. It's not like a secret companion thing. Um, and uh, also, you can put the companion in your main deck and if you don't have to meet the cost. So, for example, if you just want a 5-mana five 5-4, five which is with this ability, when it enters, draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mana cost 3 or greater, which you will want because it's just a good card, you don't have to meet the cost. You can just put it in the deck and uh, into the main deck. You don't have to do the whole fancy companion stuff, and you will still be able to play the card, though getting a free card on the sideboard is essentially like drawing a pretty good spell and always having access to it. So that's very powerful and definitely something you're going to want to keep in mind. So that is all of the mechanics. Um, there is companion. There is uh, mutate, which is a very complicated one. There is keyword counters, which is pretty simple, and cycling, which is a returning mechanic. If you have any questions about how any of those work, I will have a link to this article in the description, or you can ask me your questions. Um, that is going to do it for this video, though. Remember to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel so you can get all preview content for Ikoria Layer of Behemoths as it comes out, and uh, be sure to uh, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. That's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you in my next one.